Robin Hood Radio presents Your Health with osteopathic physician Dr. Kim Tripp, a show presented monthly on Robin Hood Radio, discussing the challenges faced and the solutions that are available for keeping vital health and well-being throughout our lives. And now, here's Dr. Tripp. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Your Health with Dr. Kim Tripp, osteopathic physician. This is the health show created to bring you vital information and discussion of all sorts of health issues on your mind and in your life from the unique perspective of traditional osteopathic medicine. So first, let's clarify what osteopathic medicine means. Osteopathic medicine is practiced by fully licensed physicians in the US with a DO degree, a doctor of osteopathic medicine degree. Our practice is based on the essential relationship in all living things between structure and function. In other words, the natural interdependence between anatomy and physiology or that between the physics of the body and its chemistry. As osteopathic physicians, we use our comprehensive and precisely detailed knowledge of anatomy and physiology to promote health and healing in our patients. We work gently with our hands to help your body restore optimal function based on optimal structure. Our medical specialty is therefore called osteopathic manual medicine, manual as in hands. We receive uniquely in-depth training in anatomy and physiology and their relationship within your body in the context of a full physician's medical training. Only U.S. trained osteopaths are fully licensed physicians and have all of the current medical pharmacopoeia, nutritional science, and full medical training at our disposal. This means that your individual treatment may include a wide range of approaches but it will always be founded on our gentle hands-on work. We practice from the unique perspective of first looking for the health in our patients rather than merely finding illness and disease. Our practice has been especially effective for, but not limited to, musculoskeletal and other structural issues, as well as problems like chronic headache, gastrointestinal issues, post-concussive syndrome, sleep disturbance, allergies, and many, many other problems. We work together with you, the patient, to help you build health and vitality in your body, mind, and spirit as the solution for health problems, rather than only treating the disease symptoms. So in the radio show, we tackle health issues from this point of view. What can we do to help you build your health and vitality in order to prevent and heal injuries and disease? And we do that by giving you some basic information about the problem to help you understand what is happening, as well as to offer solutions and guidance for helping yourself to heal and stay healthy based on our clinical experience with patients in our practice. And before we get started on today's topic, let me just remind you that you can listen to all of the prior Your Health shows online at your convenience, such as the shows on back pain, nutrition, carpal tunnel, concussion, et cetera, by going to the Goldman Trip website www.goldmantripp.net, click on the radio show icon, then scroll down and click on the individual shows by topic. There are now nearly 50 of them. You can also get the most recent show podcasts on the Robin Hood Radio website itself in the on-demand section. It's all at your fingertips. What we're going to tackle in our ongoing series of shows here is the extraordinary human immune system. This system is clearly on everyone's mind right now in the context of the current pandemic. The human immune system is a highly complex system of interactive organs, tissues, and specialized cells that serve to protect the entire body from foreign substances and toxins, from invading microbes like bacteria, fungi, and viruses, and from our own cells gone awry by producing that immune response. The immune response is a multi-layered biology that ultimately uses many different normal cells, tissues, organs, and physiological strategies within our own body to clear these problematic substances, invaders, or abnormal cells from the body itself. Normal immune system development and function relies on one basic biological principle, that is, the ability of that immune system to recognize substances, organisms, and cells that are in or on the body as being either self or other, 
and then to respond with the appropriate physiological interaction with that substance, organism, or cell. It sounds simple, but in order to function successfully, that simple biological principle must be manifested as a nearly infinite array of sensing and response mechanisms throughout our entire life, starting in utero and adapting and evolving through birth, infancy, childhood, adulthood, and old age. So today we're gonna to continue with our exploration of that miraculous system, and we'll delve into the details much more deeply as we work through the series. Remember, as we dive into this discussion, that the immune system has the complex task of recognizing what belongs to the self and what is other, and then deciding whether or not the so-called foreign material or microbe is actually harmful or beneficial. Not all microbes are harmful. We have an enormous microflora of thousands of kinds of diverse bacteria and yeasts that are meant to live in various parts of our body in appropriate relative proportion to each other. So not too much of this one, not too much of that one, but lots of this one. And keep within their appropriate location in the colon versus the eyelid, for example. And the immune system has to be able to recognize all of that and help keep it in balance. Recall that last time we considered the physical components of the immune system at the organ and tissue levels. There are also numerous kinds of specialized cells produced by the various components of the immune system to help do the job of protecting the body. To review briefly, there are several organs and tissues that play foundational roles, including the skin, the mucous membranes of the mouth, nose, airways, reproductive and urinary tracts, the tonsils and adenoids, the entire gastrointestinal system, the liver, the thymus gland, the spleen, our bone marrow, and lymph nodes, lymph tissue, and lymph vessels. Today, we're gonna to begin exploring immune function at the level of those specialized cells we keep mentioning that are involved with all of these organs and tissues. In order to understand all the various specialized cells and the full armamentarium of the immune system, we need to take a look at how these are functionally organized in the body in terms of an immune response. There are two basic systems of immune defensive response, innate and adaptive. The adaptive set of responses is further categorized into humoral or cellular and we'll talk much more about that when we explore the adaptive system. The innate system is a kind of rapid first responder with generalized responses to all intruders and abnormal cells. The adaptive system takes longer to respond as it provides specific antibodies and defenses tailored to the specific intruder. The adaptive system is activated by the innate system. Innate immune systems are found widely in all multicellular life forms, whereas adaptive immune systems are solely a feature of vertebrate physiology. The adaptive immune system arose in evolution less than 500 million years ago and is confined to vertebrates. Innate immune responses, on the other hand, have been found among both vertebrates and invertebrates, as well as in plants. And the basic mechanisms that regulate these innate immune responses are conserved, meaning they're the same across all the organisms that have them. The innate immune responses in vertebrates are required to activate the adaptive immune responses. Both systems exist to defend us from potentially damaging organisms like bacteria, viruses, fungi, and worms, collectively all called pathogens, referring to their capacity to generate pathology, i.e. disease, as well as harmful foreign materials and toxins. Both the innate and adaptive immune systems work together in an interdependent approach to dealing with pathogens. Pathogens directly activate innate immune responses against infection in all multicellular organisms. In vertebrates though, Pathogens and the innate immune responses they cause stimulate adaptive immune responses also, which then help fight the infection with more specifically targeted defenses than the innate immune system can offer on its own. The innate system is therefore more generalized and faster to respond. 
The adaptive system generates specific responses to recognized entities and therefore is more targeted, but also therefore takes longer to mount a response. The innate system, once activated, catalyzes the activation of the adaptive system. You can think of the innate system as generalized security guards patrolling an area who react somewhat similarly to whomever or whatever the intruder is, and then call for the particular reinforcements of the adaptive system, having described the specific weapons the intruder is carrying so that the adaptive responders have just the right counterforces at their disposal. Another way to think of it is as if the innate system is your primary care doctor who will use their usual toolbox of exam and medications to tackle your health issues. But if the problem is more complex, they will call in the relevant adaptive system specialists having determined that you need, for example, an infectious disease specialist. So of course this takes more time. The adaptive responses are highly specific to the particular pathogen that induced them they can also provide long lasting protection. A person who recovers from measles, for example, is protected essentially for life against measles by the adaptive immune system, although not against other common viruses, such as those that cause mumps or chickenpox. There is a complex cascade of responses that makes this possible that we'll discuss in more detail when we return to the adaptive system. We encounter millions of potential pathogens daily through contact, ingestion, and inhalation. Our ability to avoid infection depends in part on the adaptive immune system, which remembers previous encounters with specific pathogens and destroys them when they attack again. Adaptive immune responses, however, are slow to develop on first exposure to a new pathogen. It can take a week or so before the responses are effective. By contrast, in one day, Certain types of bacteria can produce almost 20 million offspring in one hour from one single bacterium, creating a rampant infection in one day. Therefore, during those first crucial hours and days of exposure to a new pathogen, we rely fully on our innate immune system to defend us. Therefore, we're gonna focus on the innate system to begin with, and we'll tackle the adaptive system in the next show. The innate immune response is well named as it refers to the set of immune responses you were born with. Innate immune responses are not targeted to a particular pathogen in the way that that adaptive immune response is. The innate immune system includes physical barriers such as skin, the gastrointestinal tract, the respiratory tract, the nasopharynx, Cilia, which are small hair-like projections that beat foreign matter up and out of the lungs, for example, eyelashes, and other body hair. It also includes defense fluids and films, including bodily secretions, mucus, bile, gastric acid, saliva, tears, and sweat. The epithelial surfaces of the body, including the lining of the gut and lungs, are coated with a mucus layer that acts as a barrier and a trap for infectious agents and toxins. The mucus layer also contains substances that kill pathogens or inhibit their growth. Among the most abundant of these are antimicrobial compounds called defensins, logically enough, which are found in all animals and plants. And general immune responses that rely on certain immune cells and compounds designed for a general response to intruders and toxins. The innate immune response utilizes selected proteins and cell types called phagocytic cells. Phagocytic means cells that engulf, digest, and destroy toxins or microbes, literally an eating cell. Phagocytic cells recognize certain characteristics and physical microscopic features found only on pathogens, a sort of the pirate's skull and crossbones flags, as it were. And then they become rapidly and automatically activated to help destroy the invading pathogen. How does the innate immune system know the good guys from the bad guys? It relies on detecting particular types of molecules that are common to many kinds of pathogens, but are not found in us. 
These pathogen type molecules called pathogen associated immunostimulants, again, logically enough, stimulate two types of innate immune responses, inflammatory responses and phagocytosis, that's cell eating, by certain types of immune cells. Both of these responses can occur quickly, even if the host has never been previously exposed to a particular pathogen, which is a good introduction to review the basic immune cell types in the innate immune system. There are others in the adaptive system too, like the famous B and T cells, which we'll talk about when we tackle the adaptive system. They are all different types of white blood cells as opposed to the hemoglobin containing red blood cells that carry oxygen to all the cells in our bodies. White blood cells do not contain hemoglobin and all have a role in infection control. White blood cells are also called leukocytes. Leuco meaning pale or white, cytes meaning cells. The innate leukocytes, i.e. white blood cells, include natural killer cells, mast cells, eosinophils, and basophils, and the innate phagocytic cells, those eating cells, including macrophages and neutrophils, and all function within the immune system by identifying and eliminating pathogens that might cause infection. Let's explore a little bit what each of these cell types do. Natural killer cells have the ability to induce self-destruction in viral and cancer cells by releasing cytotoxic compounds, meaning toxic compounds that kill or destroy the cells, and they carry them within their own membranes. Mast cells and basophils contain and release pro-inflammatory histamines and heparin, which is an anticoagulant, and they are involved in initial defense and the allergic reactions, as well as in asthma. Eosinophils have numerous functions. They are involved in many inflammatory processes, especially allergic disorders, and their immune functions include trapping foreign substances, killing cells, and providing antiparasitic and bactericidal activity. Neutrophils are the most prevalent white blood cell in the body. They are very mobile and quickly travel to and collect at sites of infection where they recruit and activate other cells of the immune system and play a key role in the frontline defense against invading pathogens. Neutrophils have multiple methods for attacking microorganisms, including phagocytosis, that eating, and degranulation, release of soluble antimicrobial compounds. Macrophages are large phagocytic cells that engulf and destroy invading bacteria, dead cells and cell fragments and foreign substances. Macrophage means big eater. Macrophages are also involved in the adaptive immune system and we'll discuss their role there in the next show on that adaptive system. In addition to these specialized cells of the innate immune system, there is another component of our frontline innate immune system called the complement system. The complement system consists of about 20 interacting soluble proteins that are made mainly by the liver and circulate in the blood and extracellular fluid. Most are inactive until they are triggered by an infection. They were originally identified by their ability to amplify and quote, complement the action of antibodies, but some components of complement are also an important part of the innate immune system and can be activated directly by those pathogen associated immunostimulants. Remember those? It is a complex cascade reaction that complements and augments the innate immune response in part by augmenting the inflammation response. So let's not forget that inflammation response, which is a crucial part of the innate immune response. Our next show will explore what inflammation is and how it contributes to our innate immune response. You can see how complex and comprehensive the innate immune system is that we are born with, 
And this does not include the adaptive system, which is also incredibly complex and comprehensive, but that's for a future show as well. So this was a brief overview today of the functional systems with major roles and specifically those within the innate immune system. Meanwhile, it's important to remember that all of these immune organs and cells are physical entities that can suffer from physical three-dimensional restrictions, contractions, twists and contortions, such as limited diaphragm excursion, muscle spasms around the organs or lymph vessels, compression of soft tissues, or other issues that can impede blood flow and other fluid flow and lymphatic drainage, all so important for management of inflammatory responses, thereby negatively impacting organ and immune function. So the physical health and well-being of these organs and tissues is equally as important as their biochemical health and well-being. Which brings me back to osteopathy and to the close of today's show here with a reminder that an osteopathic physician who is a specialist in osteopathic manual medicine can be very helpful for immune issues of all kinds, working gently with our hands, with the involved organs, nerves, vasculature, fascias, capsules, and associated tissues to release restrictions in the physical tissues of the immune organs the diaphragm, the chest, and the involved blood and lymphatic flow, as well as to help balance the autonomic nervous system function based on anatomical detail, and to help with nutritional issues and support for whatever procedures or treatments you may be going through. Recall that all of the immune system is a complex physical entity with connections between all the parts that need to be open, flexible, and moving freely with excellent neural conduction from the nerves, optimal arterial and venous blood flow and lymphatic drainage to remain healthy, vital and functioning normally. Well, we've certainly run out of time now. Thank you so much for your attention to Your Health with Dr. Kim Tripp. Remember, you can email your comments and suggestions for topics to yourhealth at robinhoodradio.com. If you have a health issue yourself and would like to find out about how we might be able to help you in our practice of traditional osteopathy, we are at our offices in Sharon, Connecticut. Dr. Kim Tripp and Dr. Andrew Goldman, Goldman Tripp Osteopathic Healthcare, 860-364-5990, with evening hours Wednesdays and Fridays. Or we're on the web at www.goldmantripp.net. Take care of yourself. I'll look forward to being with you next time and enjoy your health. Thank you for listening. <laughs>